individual. <laughs> it's really accurate. But speaking of taking jabs, man, I, Carl Anthony Towns, his whispering eye has, <laughs> has just been exposed. And shout out funny movies and role models. Yeah. I was watching that last night, right? And he goes and tell her, tell her you want to see her whispering eye. <laughs> You know, and, and and for some reason, when when they, when he said that, I Carl Anthony Towns flashed in my my. I just he your, had, your he, Malcolm Blink. Yeah, yeah. It was it was just kind of like, oh, yeah, whisper. That's exactly how I would describe Carl Anthony Towns in the playoffs. He's Ooh. just did, did we? I didn't even cover this, but Ilya Sova, dude, like he, I I knew Bellinelli was mm-hmm. was good. Ilya Sova is fucking, and he, he looks like he's eating horse meat, dude. Like he's <laughs> he. He, he's just he looks you want to talk about big. Goonie he's way bigger than I thought way more Goonie and just like getting down he adds a real element of toughness to the Sixers man they made some real moves yeah they like that overseas feel mm-hmm. that's where they're mm-hmm. kind of shopping around alright y'all here we go is it episode 13 13 13 okay okay lucky 13 that NBA life shout episode out to 13. MS 13 Peyton Manning <laughs> just kidding um, Saturday morning 4 21 feeling lovely yes um you know so we're kind of towards what are we we're headed into game fours of the first round of the nba playoffs um i'm gonna go ahead and let you let you get into where do you want to take you want to go back in the week a little bit well yeah i kind of want to do a summation of game two and game three some different things that were out there we might as well start with the Cavs. i was seeing juicy j jr smith who's much more <laughs> active i think he's on that bands make him dance Love also had about 15 rebounds in game two. He contributed. Um, LeBron, 16 first quarter, or yeah, 16 points in the first quarter by himself. Motor was much higher. Beautiful turnaround jumper. It seems like he went back to his roots. And each athlete, I would encourage you to examine, you know, what are your fundamentals? What makes you who you are? Because I've noticed more recently, I'm trying to go back to some of my roots, and it's been helping me in my small area of athletics but it seems like lebron came out there like he first was coming out there like forget anybody else i'm gonna get mine and it helped in game two i think calderon gives a boost to the Cavs. he looks kind of like the butler from mr deeds who you could whack on his foot he just kind of has that spanish butler type look nance had a huge volleyball spike type block he's just like stretch armstrongs the way his arms look it's kind of crazy and culver was looking like dr spock out there behind the three-point line so they did decently in game two however in game three oladipo had some very clutch threes he used his emotions at the right time i actually saw him lose his cool a little bit with one of the refs after he had been pushed and pushed and pushed and then after that he was like forget it and he kept on using that dribble in space you were talking right, about. Right, the close, the he gaps closer. Uh, Bogdanovic, we're going to talk about the immigrant mentality here in a, in a little bit, but Bogdanovic was contributing. Young had a big block on James, which was kind of demoralizing for him. They won the turnover battle. And I think that Lance Stevenson reminds me a little bit of Martin Lawrence. I think that he's just kind of got that type of funny, silent jerk within him. And they were getting tons of easy putbacks, and they crowded the paint. I think that's why where they're really killing the Cavs. If you notice, they get tons of offensive putbacks, and it just seems like who's in the paint for the Cavs? I'm not sure. Who's yeah, they're there. undersized. They're undersized too. And 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 with Tristan being out of the rotation, I guess he gets booed in Cleveland. It's like really? a thing. Like yeah, I mean, because the, the beloved Kardashians dare you, you know, not. But I mean, it's a dirtbag thing, especially like during the pregnancy. <laughs> that that magnifies it, right? Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, the Cavs, they just they just flat out look overmatched, man. Like I, I just feel like Indiana's the better team. Yesterday evening you saw Bogdanovich go with like Reggie Miller, like seven or eight three pointers. And LeBron, uh, to I'll credit him, his shooting is way smoother, right? He, it's I think what he's done is he doesn't elevate as much. I've talked about this several times where like I always use Jason Kidd as an example where when his legs slowed down a bit, he found his jumper, right? Because he doesn't elevate. And if you watch LeBron, he 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 doesn't elevate as much on his jumper, even his threes, those threes late. Um, I thought it was I thought it was interesting. They were hard trapping Oladipo. And they're just and and this and I'll touch on this in the Pelicans Portland series, but he they just weren't swinging the ball swift enough at the end there. Mm-hmm. And I thought like you know I thought that would be an easier play. You you know the trap's coming. One two passes should result in a dunk or a wide open shot. Mm-hmm. And so it got a little hairy there at the end. But Cleveland's in trouble, and the fact that he's having to exert so much energy 
you know, Kevin, I, I want to say, I want to point one thing out. Kevin Love, I, it he when he leans to the side, when he pump fakes a, a, a defender who's closing out and he jumps into them almost horizontally, it's egregious. Like they mm -hmm. need, the league needs to be like, watch him. He is the prototype for jumping into the closeout defender and drawing an offense, three free throws when it's an offensive foul. Mm -hmm. And so I did not like that. But um, I think the series, I mean, Cleveland may even get out. We, you, and I think you hear the media, the national media is kind of like, oh, LeBron, you can't ever doubt him. So he may carry them out of the series, but it will cost them like they won't make it out of the next. Right. If yeah. They you, do. You're talking about that cost. And you, you've said several times there's a cost associated with every de decision and every player you allow on your team. And from a financial standpoint, it's looking like whenever you go to the gas station, you need to get gas but you might have left your wallet in the car or you don't know where your wallet's at or if you have enough change for the candy and chips that you want to kind of have to think like, dang, do I have enough to make it? I see the Cavs looking kind of like that. Do we have enough change in our pockets to cover the bill? And it doesn't seem like they do. Or whenever you go out with friends and y'all look at the bill and we're trying to split up who's about mm -hmm. to pay what, and you're like, nah, nah, you need to take mm -hmm. this extra $5 off. I think that LeBron is kind of going into that mode in some ways because his supporting cast is not as strong and you have to think about it they haven't been playing together for that long a lot of those trades are still relatively fresh so team chemistry it's not like they've had all year to mold and gel you know they might be behind that learning curve in comparison to some other teams who've been doing it for longer together yeah yeah it's and then uh, clarkson hood george hill they all like to they like they all like the ball quite a bit mm -hmm. you know what i mean corver and jr and love have adapted right they've been there longer and they can they can play without getting a lot of touches those other guys and then they're young and on top of that it's their first playoffs i would play nance jr as much as i could i think he's the one young guy that doesn't look scared out there mm -hmm. right his aggression um Lance is so fun to watch the eighth grader but he's so rhythmic mm -hmm. right everything he he's he has like he has one rhythm Mm -hmm. And it, it, I equate it to like a fighter, but if you time it up, I think that you can you can take it away. Now he's very strong, so yes. if he he can bump you and get mm -hmm. that mid range jumper, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that if you play him like throughout a series, mm -hmm. you can kind of pick up on his rhythm. It's it's yeah. that irky jerky street rhythm, mm -hmm. and like I, there was a couple threes. He took a couple threes late where he was it was he basically can't catch and shoot. You know what I'm saying? He can't, like, if you gap him and you're like, all right, and you don't let him, like, kind of rock into his shot, mm -hmm. there's no, like, I guarantee you he probably shoots, like, 20%. Sure, sure. He reminds me of that kid that would be in the public school lunchroom, like, throwing something at somebody to pop the fight off. Like, like Lance definitely is the hype man. He's not afraid to approach a crowd and be like, man, fuck y'all. Mm -hmm. You know what Like, I think mm -hmm. he's definitely the mouthpiece. And you're right, being conditioned into that style of athleticism and, and competition it can limit your other opportunities. I think that's why you see once he gets down in a fight, he doesn't necessarily know how to fight back from what I've seen. But if he strikes first and he's on top with that emotion. Yeah, he's a bully. Yeah, he's a bully. But yeah, I, yeah. I I do. Mm -hmm. I don't think it helps per se that I know they're saying, oh, well, LeBron has to think about him. He's an irritant. I don't I don't necessarily um, promote the idea of ag aggravating LeBron. Sure. Right. And, and kind of poking the bear, if you will. I'm not sure that's that 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 will work out well. Mm -hmm. Um. Did you did you catch I, the one series? I, I'll admit that I'm because you have to pick and choose in these first rounds. You can't watch all the games. The Boston Milwaukee series, I'm not really fucking with. Yeah, I've been watching it and it's been entertaining. Jalen Brown been hitting some excellent threes, had some big dunks. He's got kind of an AC Green type phenotype, or just his look. I mean, probably just the, the, <laughs> yeah, just the, the, the look. The, don't, just, the, just the look. Yeah, don't, don't, yeah, no. yeah that's just that's the, blasphemous. Just, just the box fan. Jalen Brown's been getting pussy way longer than AC <laughs> Green. <laughs> yeah, he's been passing it up, right? So yeah, um, Horford, he's a lot more athletic than you would think. He's an old man, but he gets out there and he's been doing his thing. Rozier was on some look, ma, no hands. He had some Kyrie type moves the other day. Kyrie's gone, so he was trying Rozier, to show. Rozier's underrated. Rozier is probably a starting point guard. I know Durant was speaking on that. Durant Sanders. loves to give love to the young guys. I, I want to. I know I'm, I'm veering off here, but mm -hmm. a lot. You know how a lot of players they don't want to credit, especially while they're playing. Oh, he's I. Right, he's good. Durant will be like McCollum can't guard him. Mm -hmm. Rozier, oh, he's a monster. Mm -hmm. So I think that's interesting. But Rozier, it'll be interesting. I'm not sure the contract situation. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to be able to retain him as a backup guard. Right? Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. he's going to go he's play point nice. guard for somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you got Bane, the Scarecrow. That's what they used to call Kevin McHale. He's just a big, oafy looking looking cat. He's the bigger version of the mascot, the lucky Irish dude. And then who that cat marking in, he was interesting. Some of his moves and he's relatively short, but he's got mad hops. Reminds me of kind of like Leprechaun in the hood. Who's what, that? What a ridiculous movie that was. Markinen, um, I think in number nine, I could be incorrect. Oh, okay. But he just looks hecka young. And, and is he on Boston? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Larkin. Larkin. I'm Larkin. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mark. Markin. So Markin. And yeah, we, yeah, there's the names. I, I People know I butcher names, especially the European ones. Markin is the rookie in Chicago. Okay. Like, you know who that is. That's Barry Larkin's son. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he's, right. then, yeah, yeah. I had his name wrong. But yeah. Yeah, he, he definitely struck me as an undersized cat, but he was definitely. Um... Yeah. He's under six. But him and Rogier, they get after it. They're, they, mm-hmm. they're, they're a nuisance to play against Steven's system. Now, Milwaukee won last night. Right. They blew him out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Stevenson, the people have been or Stevens, they've been giving him tons of credit. He is a big brain and he's shown consistent success everywhere he's gone. So and it, they're saying that they're just crazy enough to believe that they can win with all the things that they've had happen to still be competing. They've they've got a solid set of core values, it appears. You were talking about- universal rules. Right. And then you add Kawhi Leonard next season. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, no, nah, but I, I'm getting, <laughs> old, but, but back to Milwaukee, I was thinking about it and I, I saw, I, I watched the highlight. I just didn't watch the game and it's, and it's, they're on early and it's the one, cause now in this first round, the games, they kind of stack on each other. They're not like separated. Um, if you think about it, y- G- Giannis mm-hmm. is playing with all six men. Mm-hmm. Like, like if you took every other player on that roster on a championship contending team, mm-hmm. they're all like ideally your sixth man. Mm-hmm. Bledsoe, mm-hmm. Brogdon, mm-hmm. Middleton, mm-hmm. Jabari, mm-hmm. right? They're all like good players and, and they may become more. They're, you know, it's a relatively young roster, but I'm just saying right now, every other guy player around him on like on the Warriors, on the Rockets, mm-hmm. right? On these on these championship color teams are your sixth man, maybe your seventh guy. Mm-hmm. Right. None of them are like the guy next to him. I think Jabari has potential to be a starting good guy, but he's he hasn't played enough yet. Mm-hmm. So the talent, I don't think the talent is as good as as people may think around around um Giannis, but then the they gotta go get a coach. True. The one thing I did see is that Cat Maker. Yeah, Thon. Yeah, he had three African dads. That blue brother. Blocks. That blue brother yeah, Thon. Yeah, he was real African looking. <laughs> um, y'all got to check out the African dad vines again if you get a chance. They're real, real funny. Um, they kind of are stereotypical, but it's definitely true how African fathers can be with the discipline and the pimp slapping. But he definitely was throwing balls way out there. Like people were going up and he was just like volleyballing them. Mm-hmm. I think he had like four blocks within like four or five minutes so he's definitely trying to compete and when you were talking about Giannis um that self-preservation is real he had a huge dunk but he ended up falling backwards and yeah luckily he's young and he's got kind of that Gumby type swag Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. your body's not going to hold up doing that craziness you know he's always in the air real high and I just see him hitting the the deck I think I I like his better than some I think that I think that he he's so athletic and and this is something that happens with Anthony Davis too, is he gets places so swiftly and elevates so high and quickly that it puts himself in compromising positions, right? Where like the defender is like, oh shit, all of a sudden his nuts are on my shoulder. (laughs) And you know what I mean? And they can't get out of the way. Mm -hmm. But one thing that Giannis does is, if you notice, he likes to hang on the rim. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys, a lot of dunkers, right? They like to spike it. Mm -hmm. And then that means you're coming down full impact wherever it may be. Giannis will hang. He likes two hands and he likes to hang kind of shack style where he'll swing around the rim. Mm -hmm. And I think that- To dissipate some- Yeah, I think that that's key. Um, for him, but yeah, he's so, he covers so much ground and he's so fast and big, but he's always going to be a high risk. Well, you were talking a little bit about Davis. What's your take on the Pelicans? I heard in one of your more recent videos, you were saying, man, we might need to get ready for these. Oh, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. So we, Port, I picked them, right? I picked the Pelicans over Portland before game one, go check my Twitter feed. Mm-hmm. But, um, it, I guess I'm going to, before I do a breakdown on this series, the Warriors Pelican series, it's coming, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I want, I'm going to go rewatch all four games. I, I believe the sweep will happen today. Show some damn pride, Portland. Show yeah. some goddamn pride. Mm-hmm. But uh, they've had seven to eight straight losses in the playoffs. Yeah, they, it, it, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. And I guess what I want to see is there's no doubt the Pelicans are playing amazing. Miritich, Anthony Davis, the backcourt, right? 
but I, I, how much of it is Portland kind of shitting themselves as well? Because the, the thing that stuck out to me was Dame is not passing out of the trap quick enough. Anthony Davis is the ultimate trump card when it comes to trapping and helping off pick and rolls or coming because he's so fast and long, he can recover, right? He can show hard, hedge on the guard, trap, and then he can still recover, get back to the rim or challenge a shooter in the corner, right? Mm -hmm. So they have that weapon with the two aggressive guards. But Dame is taking four and five dribbles once the trap comes. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it's insane to me that that hasn't been altered. Terry Stouts and, and Dame, I know, I don't think, I think Dame's a smart player, but I think Again, your strengths or your weaknesses. He's too hard headed. Mm -hmm. He's too. He's like trying to dribble through these traps. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll break down more that it clearly they won't be able to do that against Golden State at full strength. But I think that as well as as Drew and Rondo have played, the story is Miritich. So yeah, Miritich from Madrid. And his shooting has added spacing elements that have transformed his offense to a well-oiled machine. He's giving Davis space to operate inside and create driving lanes for Holiday and Rondo. His shooting has added spacing elements and has transformed the offense, like we were stating. And he is definitely contributing on the defensive end as well. He was kind of offended when people were discussing, like, wow, you had a great defensive effort. And he's like, well, yeah, that's what I do. So he's not afraid of playing both sides of the ball. Hmm. And, um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I think... At his size, he's a legit seven foot. Mm -hmm. And what what people have to appreciate is even when Portland closes out well, he still can get the shot off and get a clean look. That's the, the you can't teach size, man. And to ha like to have a seven foot guy that can spread and shoot from well behind the arc. Mm -hmm. It's the closeout sometimes is irrelevant on him. Mm -hmm. And he's just been he's shown toughness. He's sprained the ankle on like every game he's played. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and it just doesn't seem to bother him. I will say that playoff Rondo, I know that that's a real thing. He hits the floor violently with no regard four or five times a game. We'll see how long that lasts. Mm -hmm. We'll see how long that lasts. Mm -hmm. um, well, when you talk about that immigrant mentality, he's from Croatia. So I would challenge you guys, what's the capital of Croatia? None of us know this. I used to teach geography for a Tony Kukoc? <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's around near Hungary, Serbia, and Slovenia. So Zagreb is actually the um, capital, but yeah, he was um, kind of some different things to, to, to think about, but I, I think you might be right with that, that standpoint. How much is it that the other squad is just not really? Well, we'll see here. I, I want in being obviously being Golden State fan. I, I don't want to sweep. I want them to be pushed somewhat. And it's going to be New Orleans isn't exactly a home court, but are they going to show are we going to get one performance from Dame? Or McCollum just lightning, you know, where this is the closeout game, right? So I I wouldn't be surprised if Portland won one, but I don't think you're going to get a 45, 50-point night from, from Dame, which everybody's expecting because of the way they're playing it. He hasn't shown the ability to deal with that trap. And so it's going to have to be from someone else. Harkless, Aminu, those guys, Nurkic, even from behind, they're going to have to step out and hit threes to win this game because they're. I think New Orleans is like, all right, you Dame is is not handling the trap well, and so I don't know. But yeah, if I were a betting man, it's going to be a sweep, mm -hmm. um, and that leads me to uh, Dame Lillard for Kawhi Leonard. Mm. let's just get it done right now <laughs> let's just get it done right now <laughs> no um but yeah i mean these are going to be the rumors that we're going to see and I, I there's something between washington portland and san antonio make it happen so you've got wall beal dame mccullum and Kawhi. Mm -hmm. I, I i don't i don't know how now portland fans you probably say no we want to trade cj but i i would argue that you get way more for dame and then CJ is, is and so, you know, CJ, let's say CJ is 80% of what Dame can is, right? Mm -hmm. But you're going to net way more for Dame. You trade CJ, you're not going to get as much back, I don't mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then I feel that CJ, you can put more around. Dame is very ball dominant. CJ's already proven he can play off ball, right? And mm -hmm. so it, it just opens up more possibilities to style of play if you retain CJ. So Dame for McCall, and I guess the thing would be is why would Kawhi want to be in Portland? But fuck Kawhi at this point. I mean, I don't think San Antonio's. He doesn't. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, he doesn't have a no trade clause. So I don't think San Antonio's going to be like, well, uh, Kawhi, would you like to go to L.A. or yeah, possibly yeah. Boston? You know, yes, they're going to yeah. send his ass to Orlando for Aaron Gordon. <laughs> Have his ass out of Disney World looking real sad with his fucking braids and cutlass, man. But <laughs> could you just see him with Mickey Mouse pictures? 
<laughs> I, I throw that out there because because I'm looking, I'm thinking about Pop and what he would like in back into that system. And Aaron Gordon mm -hmm. has the physical attributes and character profile for San Antonio where, like, my God, they could turn him into the defensive player of the year. Mm -hmm. They could really turn him into... Uh, I, I'm thinking about it here. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I think that I think that San Antonio could turn Aaron Gordon into a better player than Kawhi has been. It, it, it's it's a possibility. Like it, it's not. A, it, you know what I mean. Obviously, things have to go right, and it's the trade hasn't even happened. I'm just saying he has that type of attributes, mm -hmm. and I'm only saying that now because he's shown he can shoot the three. I didn't think that was gonna happen, mm -hmm. but now that he can shoot the three, because he's bigger, and. Uh, you know, he'd be more of a forward center, I guess, than Kawhi is kind of like a guard forward. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying it has the same potential. Yeah, man. On the Spurs, you think about DeJounte Murray and how he grew up. I believe the young man's from Seattle. And they did some interviews with him. And they were stating that he had a real tough upbringing. And I saw two pictures of him that made me think something. Mm -hmm. I could be completely inaccurate. I don't know that much about the man. But it seems like he'd be the type of dude that would relish in someone else's misfortune, but not in a bad way. And I think it would be environmental. And the reason why I say that is there's a picture of him taking Tony Parker off of the floor. And in a part of it, he's kind of smiling. And I've done some face recognition study to where you put someone on a jury or actually when they're getting interrogated or doing cross-examination. And it's a function of their eyes will say yes while their body will be physically saying no. So if you look at someone's tells, poker players are good at them too. Remember Abraham Lincoln said, men are not made to lie. If their mouth lies, their body will tell Congru the truth. Congruent, being, remaining congruent. Right. right? So what I, I noticed about him is he knew he might be better than Tony Parker at this point in time. And when Kawhi went down, there's a picture we'll post where if you look at his face, he looks kind of like he's sad. But there's also a part of it that looks kind of like, oh, now it's time for me. It's to my turn. Out. Yeah. It's my turn. So when they, inter they interviewed him, they were talking about how he has great wingspan. He was a standout where he came from, kind of lower in the draft. But he said that this is my party. When I come here, I feel like this is my drug. Murray told ESPN. This is my drug? Before. Yeah. Poor he, choice of words. Well, well, but no, but even because he, where he grew up in Seattle, like it was crack fiends, gun smoke, gangs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So whenever they're asking him, you know, what keeps you fearless and unimpressed by competition? He said that court out there, that's where, that's my drug. That's my shit. Okay. You know what I'm saying? That's where I get down. That's my training facility. Because I understand being a black male in this world, you don't really get a chance. You're already a target no matter who it is what situation it is. And that was kind of an interesting statement to me because whenever you look at him, the way he's built and his background where he grew up, he you can tell he has a chip on his shoulder. And all I'm trying to say is he just seems like the type of dude that wouldn't want someone to get hurt by any means. But it was kind of interesting to me that when you see two pictures of him where people have gotten hurt on his squad, there's a kind of a smirk or like this hmm. hidden, you know, he wants to step up. He's hungry. Right. It doesn't matter who has to fall out the way. And once you grow up in a grimy situation, I think that's naturally inbred. You're not as concerned about someone else's misfortune. It doesn't make you sneaky or sleazy. You just understand, well, that's how the breaks is. Now it's time for me. Right. You learn, uh, you, you develop less compassion, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to, mm -hmm. otherwise you, you, you like, you know what I mean? It'd be harder to move forward in a day to day. It's crazy. I went to, I went out to Seattle when I was, uh, I've been out there a couple times and I have family up there. My uncle shout out to them and, and, and some cousins. And I was out there for a week and they took me to the courts. I don't know the name. This is, this is when I was 18 or 19. So this is years and years ago, but they took me out to the courts where like Jamal Crawford and all those guys, cause Seattle has a rich hoop tradition. And it was it was out in, in Seattle and it was lit, it was legit like it was lit. Everybody was circled around and the dudes that could play could play. And it was a cool little scene. Um, so, yeah, I didn't know. I knew he played at Washington or Washington State. I knew he was from that area. But I think also there's something to be said is one. He may not fit that spur mold. And I'm I'm kind of down I, in my last Patreon video. I was kind of questioning the player. I feel like is San Antonio just like the Patriots, you know how they value they have a certain type of player they pursue, right? And if you don't meet that criteria, that it's like the opposite of the Cowboys, right? <laughs> Character matters more than talent. You know, I got to take a little shot at your yeah, boys, okay, right? Sorry. But I feel like it's almost it's almost hurting them. They're almost weighing like, okay, we want Kyle Anderson, we yes. want Rudy Gay, yes. we want right. You don't have no Draymonds. Yeah, you don't have that, and it, and it's showing when they need some fight. They don't have guys with fight, and I think mm -hmm. that hurts them a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
And I also think that because they are old school in wait your turn. So DeJounte is this his second year, right? But they bring guys along slowly. Mm-hmm. And I think part of it may be by design. So because the same thing kind of happened with Kawhi. I think he broke through pretty quickly. But, but when they are ready, it's like they're insatiable. They're like, fuck this. They've been so thirsty to show mm-hmm. that they've been ready, mm-hmm. that they have. They, they, so the Spurs kind of try to build a chip. Yes, yeah. Right? They kind of tried to build a chip. Militaristic, yeah. yeah. Somebody at the barbershop was comparing it to West Point style. You know, you're talking about Belichick and that whole... Because there's a huge connection between the military and football, as we all know, and just sports in general. And that type of brotherhood and wait your turn and rank and mm-hmm. seniority, that does breed a chip in a more of a subtle way. You mm-hmm. throw a bone out there, a bunch of some wolves... And you kind of see who's going to come up with it. But mm-hmm. you leave your hands clean. That's what Belichick does. He'll definitely be like, yeah, I think his girlfriend's a little prettier than yours. What do you, you know, like, <laughs> he'll just kind of like, you know, like make you feel like, you know, this guy's out mm-hmm. showing you. What do you think about it? And I'm sure Pop's willing to do some digs. You know, mm-hmm. Tony, keep it up. You know, see you at the house. And, you know, the little yeah, comments. Yeah, just hold him back a little. The young bucks are like, man, I well, like and and also Steven Jackson, who's been very outspoken in and I love Stack Jack as a personality and as a player, but he's a little rough on uh on he's been doing the media circuit, right? He's not he uh, yeah, I feel I mean, the it takes same time. way about Karan Butler. Okay, yeah, yeah. Kar- uh, at least Karan uh is better is better yes, spoken. You were but correct. Stack Stack basically it, I guess his appeal is he holds grudges and he's not hiding it, right? So <laughs> they were like asking him about the Kawhi situation and clearly mm-hmm. he's pissed off at the San Antonio. He's like, fuck Tony Parker, that bitch nigga, like <laughs> selfish. He wouldn't pass me the ball. He like remembered, he's like, he wouldn't pass me the ball when I hit seven threes in a row. That like, lets man. you know about Tony Parker. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay, Stack, okay. You know, <laughs> I'll take it with a grain of salt. But um, but he had brought up like, cause that, I guess the story goes when he got waived a couple days before the playoffs one year for San Antonio and he was playing well. He wasn't, this wasn't like the twilight of his career quite yet. Um, Pop t- pulled him into an office and was like, and this may not be completely accurate. I believe it was Manu. It was Manu or one of the older players, one of the guys. And he goes, you need to admit that you're, that they're better than you. Like you're going to have to fall back. Yeah, you're saying you're saying Manu was a voice of reason who was honest. No, no, no. Pop called in Stack okay. and basically was like, "Look, you need to fall back. Like yeah. you're making too much noise about touches and playing. Yeah, these are the guys." And and Stephen wouldn't Stack wouldn't wouldn't acknowledge yeah. that that dude's better than him. So then they waved him. Uh-huh. And so there's definitely like a pecking order. Mm-hmm. And I do think that guys, are, like guys, kind of are rolling. Like the guy, a guy like Dejounte may be like, because like I'm saying it in this series here with Golden State. What do you have to lose? Mm-hmm. He's your best athlete. It's not like Patty Mills is dropping 25 a night. I he's get just it. dropping people. He's dropping four. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he's dropping like 14 points a game. Yeah. And so I think that there is a part of this Spurs system and, and, and perhaps in New England, right? Jimmy G, where they're like, all right, I, they, they, they've been, they're waiting, laying in wait, and they probably are better at that point, but they're not sure. getting their turn yet. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and we all know how it is when you're not getting your turn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody's with that. Having to watch somebody else just play game after game while you sit there for the kids. It, 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 it was just thing because they this this Patriot situation just keeps getting reported of Tom and 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 all this stuff and and they keep saying and Tom wanted he went to Kraft and said he wanted Jimmy gone right. What how good one I, I say this as a Niners fan, but how good does Jimmy G have to be for Tom Brady? To be. to be like going and being like, no, we got to get him out of here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if in the locker room, perhaps Giselle. Is- <laughs> <laughs> it's just- shower time. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Jimmy the Italian stallion. <laughs> and Tom, you know, Tom's got his little avocado shrivel. And- <laughs> His little, you know, he's looking a little meek in the, in the, in, in the locker room and Jimmy G is in his prime. And, and you know, he just didn't like that outlook. Um, <laughs> anyway, man, let's get let's get back on the one series man, that, that we haven't really talked about is is the Sixers heat one. And I know you got I know you got some stuff on particularly maybe the appearance of some of these cats. Well, no, well, with the Sixers and um, Miami, I, I just yet again want to speak to their restraint. Because D Wade pulled a man down Fucking to the D ground, Wade. 
And it's just amazing to me. Like we're posting up and I grab you and I pull you to the ground and the other man gets up and wants to talk and be with some restraint. I really respect that. I, I mean, I understand that it's a well, stage. D, D, D Wade is the type that'll do some dirty shit and then he'll help you up and be like, hey, good. Hey, it's all good, yeah, homie. It hey, it's all good. Good game. Yeah, you know, like that's the, the, I, it yeah, I don't, I'm not a big fan of D Wade. But I think it was dirty what the dude did. He had his feet basically barred to where if Wade were to move, he's going to trip over his feet, mm -hmm. maybe hurt mm -hmm. himself. So it, it was both ways. You know, one person was trying to be covert. The other person was being way out there. But then Tyler Johnson also fell hard in game three, almost like a person who has a booger on their nose or drools, and you try and act like you didn't see it to keep the conversation <laughs> going, but you did see it. That's how Tyler Johnson fell. Because like he definitely got crossed real nasty. We'll have to try and find it so y'all can see. But nobody really said much about him but um the over effort of miami we talked about how dangerous they are as a physical team you've got a sure. numerous guys oh, and yeah. olenic looking like the bad guy from karate kid three <laughs> slick back dude hair. he's he's good though right his yeah, no, his I'm his good. timing is immaculate like mm -hmm. his he has very good basketball timing that's one thing i've noticed to make up for his lack of athleticism mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying he pump fakes he he rips through mm -hmm. he challenges like at the right time a lot mm -hmm. um no he's a solid dude wade Wade, Wade, that vintage Wade, I love, I'm going to steal something. I think it was Doug Gottlieb um, nailed this. Dwayne Wade is the Derek Jeter of, of the NBA. Wow. Right? Because he's, he's not like the greatest. Like, you know, he, you, I don't think you can't put him with like Barry Bonds and mm -hmm. Mickey Mantle and like all that. Like, right. Mm -hmm. But like when the lights are on, when the time comes, the moments he's always performed, man, like the super clutch gene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he's got the hardware to go behind it. Mm -hmm. I think in game two, after he'd scored a whole bunch of points, someone was saying that his wife had tweeted out to him, come on home, honey, I've got something for you. And I'm pretty sure that um, she did have something for him. I don't like Gab. He, yeah. I think it's because of her roles. Like yeah. She always plays the bitch, you yeah. know? And so I just so, don't fuck with her. I don't you, fuck with that. There's that some couple. other levels, too, of where, why you may not like her as well. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, man. Um, yeah, she... Uh, I'm sure he ran home though. You know yeah. Saying? But uh, yeah. Ben Simmons, he's so good that even the balls that get deflected out of his hands still make it to the target. There was a time where he was he was going up, and he threw it. Defender hits it and still ends up right in the guy's pocket, and his teammate still makes it. He has a split the defender behind the back between the legs move to a nice scoop with the left hand that is just so calculated. It's almost the reason why I suck at Madden is because back in the day you could just kind of press the speed burst and it wasn't time. There wasn't latency or you could, you didn't have to time the spin per se. As soon as you press, O, you're going to spin. So what I saw on that particular play was he had to have thought of this well before. And I know you could say it's instantaneous because he's practiced it hundreds of times, but he just timed it so wonderfully. There was two people closing in on him. So he hits one with the behind the back and then to split him. He goes back in between with the between the legs. And I was just very amazed by his ability to see the scenario, pull off the maneuver and just get right back to where he needed to be. So his foresight is definitely pretty strong. Bellinelli kind of reminds me of Adam Sandler in some ways. There's a funny tune where Sandler plays his redheaded sweatshirt and ends up winning 11 to 6. This is kind of amazing to me that the sweatshirt scored six points somehow. So if you get a chance, watch Redheaded Sweatshirt with with Adam Sandler. And he's an Italian dude, Bellinelli. Yeah, Italian. the Rocky Balboa tattoo. Yeah, kind of like, yeah. So he started with the Warriors. Yeah, we drafted teams, We yeah. drafted him, and this was under the Don Nelson era, and this was the Cohen era as well. So this was where we wanted, we were very, as Warrior fans, I say, we, we were very quick to anoint somebody as the next guy to save us. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those guys. And he came into the summer league his rookie year. So we hadn't seen him in the NBA and he went nuts. I believe he had like a 40 point game, like out mm -hmm. the gate. And he's always been a bad shot maker. He makes bad shots. And remember I was talking about Ginobili and his hips. There's another guy, uh, you know, another f uh, foreign player with the hip swivel. If you watch the way he, he, a he, he aims his shot with his hips. That's why he's able to shoot off balance and twisting is because no matter which way direction he's fading or moving, his hips always tilt back to the rim and that's why he's able to knock those down. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was thinking about was how many bad shot makers Philadelphia has, because mm -hmm. um, you've got Bellinelli, Covington, 
Embiid, Redick is Redick. I, I, it, it's kind of subjective because I mean he doesn't take bad shots per se, but he takes contested shots. I shouldn't say bad shots, contested mm-hmm. shot makers. Mm-hmm. Covington, Embiid, Bellinelli, and Redick can all hit threes and shots with hands in their face, draped all over them. Mm-hmm. Um, the one caveat is I think Covington is probably the only one of them that's not a defensive liability. Bell- Bellinelli's decent on defense. He, he's going to give you effort, but I mean, he's limited just with his physical attributes mm-hmm. as well as Redick, obviously. Mm-hmm. You're talking about people coming in to save a franchise. Previously, I was incorrect. This is where Brian Colangelo comes in. He used some very heavy analytics, and I was hearing Stephen A. the other day talk about how he hates this whole concept of trust the process. He even said it was un-American. Come on, Stephen, this is very aggressive but either way when it comes to brian colangelo he realized he would need reinforcements to help the sixers and make a stretch run in the playoffs and beyond he liked the idea of adding marco bellinelli and urson veterans who were likely to be released but he said the analytics are cleared i didn't know this but in your nba stadiums they can track all the movements of all of the players and he would go through and crunch this data with all of his very smart people. He grew the organization from three smart people to 10 very smart people. And it states that currently he's looking for number 11 and 12. Call it. But no. yeah, maybe, <laughs> I'm just saying, what, what, what they did was they took motion sensors of every time the person played all year, boiled it down into an algorithm and saw what spots they were the most effective for, from and mm-hmm. did all the, the crunch to the numbers. So he's very into analytics, and, and Brian Colangelo has definitely turned tons of different um, organizations around. He said, yes, we need players who love basketball, love video, and can make sense of it independently. So those are three of his criteria for mm. the players he looks for. They have to love basketball, they have to love video, and they have to be able to make sense of it independently. What, what is that? What does independently mean? So without someone coaching them through it? Yes, they have to. Okay. You know what I'm saying? They need to be able to understand what it is they need without to look someone tell yeah 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 yeah, yeah. without sh- someone telling them to what to look for uh-huh and he he kind of reminds me of roger from doug the, the bully from doug there's this will be picture. going way back on the retro <laughs> back in my day <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, no, what are you like, no, what are you <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it, but I mean, I've, when have you thought of these things? No, Are you watching people. Doug on the low? Nah, fool, as soon as you see him, he looks just Patty like Patty Mayonnaise, you. okay, okay. <laughs> Patty Mayonnaise was fresh. I wish uh, Doug could have gotten down, but either way. But, but it, you know, so I knew I knew Bellinelli. I'm very familiar mm-hmm. with him. In fact, I wanted the Warriors to try to acquire him, and it was interesting. I think he kind of, they he surprised, because every contender wanted Bellinelli, and he was like, no, I'm going to Philly. One thing about Ben Simmons, back to him, was we're talking about um, Dame not dealing with the trap well. And we saw Oladipo not deal with it particularly well down the stretch in that game the other night. You can't trap Ben Simmons at six nine. One, the size he it's very difficult, and then two, he rips the ball. He doesn't. It's about efficiency of dribble. What I'm working with with uh, Maya, my daughter here, and her she has a game today. Is mm-hmm. we figured out she only really needs one or two dribbles from the three point line. That's at 11 years old, hmm. right? And so efficiency of dribble and Ben, if you watch him, there's he 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 always looks to pass first. Again, the Nash effect, right? He doesn't take unnecessary dribbles, Mm -hmm. and that's what allows teams to trap when you take unnecessary dribbles. Mm -hmm. And so you can you're not going to be able to trap him like there. You're just not going to be able to employ that that defensive strategy against Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Um, Miami, Josh Richardson is I I'm willing to I think I'm going to go ahead and say is the best wing defender in the league. Now, he's not the most versatile. So you have Draymond, Kawhi when healthy, Anthony Davis, right? There's there's a difference where they can guard five, four, three, two, probably four positions, right? Mm-hmm. I, I I don't think he can guard like bigs and different things. But as far as like you're putting him on a shooting guard, mm-hmm. I think for the perimeter, I think he might be right now pound for pound the best perimeter defender in the league. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that I keep thinking about is, is Hassan Whiteside. And I understand Miami kind of had to pay him because it would they would basically be letting an asset go. But he's just you're seeing it right now. If you're a big, if you're a seven footer and offensively, you can't play at least out to the free throw line. Mm-hmm. Like you can't play. <laughs> you, like you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like you have to be able to at least shoot the shoot the elbow jumper. If you're just strictly can only score in the paint, it's I mean. You're basically a specialty player. And what is he, a $100 million specialty player? You know, so I thought that was interesting. Um, you were speaking about shooting real quick and with, with your daughter and some of the techniques you tried to pass on to me. And last week we were talking about this brass technique. And I want to get your ideas of how target shooting 
you know, moves over into into hoops. So it's breathe, relax, aim, then it is slack, and then it is squeeze. And the way that they break it down is shoot a a, a gun like a woman. So they say they they say shoot like whoa. a shoot like whoa, a girl. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, I'm no, not go trying, ahead, go I'm ahead. Not trying yeah. to be gender in, 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 insensitive, but they say like if you shoot a gun the way that women approach it, you're going to be more successful than if you would go away a man would approach it. Even if you look at women's NBA versus the men's NBA, the shooting technique can be a little bit different in comparison. So what I'm saying is men tend to try and string things and look at Rambo and figure they need to manhandle the rifle. Mm -hmm. But in all truth, you want to just let it loose. And my wife is honestly a better shot than me because she doesn't hold it all firm, which means that the um, everything's going to go straight. So with that concept, the reason why you want to breathe, relax, aim, slack, and squeeze is in order to um, mitigate that crossfire and make sure that the sights are, are dead on. So it says breathe, as we breathe in and out, our bodies move slightly. We wanna let oxygen in. And after you start to get the muscles shaken, you need to breathe. And if you're seeing stars or getting too lightheaded, you're doing it wrong. So at a certain point, when you're shooting a ball, mm -hmm. do you find it to be important to breathe or, or is it not something you need to really think about? No, there's a pattern to it. Okay. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm, in, I'm inhaling, on the dip of my shot and I'm exhaling on the release every okay. time okay. because it's like a chi thing. It's like okay. when you throw a punch, right? right. So tss, you're letting out your air with each punch tss, mm -hmm. tss, and that's right to defend yourself in case you get hit, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing. You're letting out the flow, the chi, the energy in the release. So yeah, that's how I coach it. I coach that you have to exhale on release. Okay, then there's a the relaxed section. If your muscles are tense, you'll develop twitches and shakes and throw off shots. You need to be relaxed when holding the gun or target in order to minimize muscle movement, you have to think happy thoughts or allow your muscles in your body to gain some slack. This will mitigate the shakes and twitches from tired muscles. So is there a function of relaxing? Because you think whenever you're shooting, if I relax, that doesn't seem like I'd have enough energy. So is there a function of allowing the muscles to relax or to not overdo something? Well, loose, I mean, fluidity. I, I always like to use the, the the fighting analogy of, right? Like a boxer, a fast boxer is a loose boxer, right? The, the, the tenser you are, the more rigid your movements are be. So it's like a flow, but, or you could relate it to like when you're teaching someone how to squat properly, right? For football or in the weight room, right? So in the decline, you, you hold your breath, right? You, you're, 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 you're taking your breath in because you want your core and your trunk tight, right? Your tension, but on the way out, you're letting the air up because, and then you, right at the mm -hmm. end, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's how I was taught with it. But so, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. um, no, I, don't, I mean, loose, right? You have to have you have to have enough tension in your body to maintain your form, Fair. right? But the air, the release of the air, I think is, it has to be like, it, it's a consistency and a flow of it. And it ensures that you have enough looseness. If you're shooting with your breath be held, then you know that you're gonna be too rigid and intense. Okay. Then there's aim. This is the part where you gain good sight alignment and the sight picture. Make sure you're focusing on the right things, like in the front of the sight. If you're using iron sights, make sure that the front of the post is centered near the rear sights. So a lot of times on a gun, you have three positions, front sights and two back sights. And some people overuse the back sights and don't really understand that aiming is simple. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You aim at something and it's not as hard and as complex as people try and make it sound. Mm -hmm. So in, in a function of aim, I was talking to Harris. He was saying he would always look at where the strings dangle for, or the, the net dangles from the the rim okay. where it's at. If you align yourself, your eyes with mm -hmm. where the, the net comes down, that's what he used as mm -hmm. a technique in college. How, what about aim? Is it, is it, I don't net? aim. Okay. I don't, I don't aim. I don't believe in using the word aim. I think when you're right. aiming in basketball, it's a negative. Right. You know what I'm saying? Don't get me wrong. Like in a literal sense, I know that guys that right, you're locking on something. Right. I just mm -hmm. I just say when it, you how you say when you're shooting, you, you, you're just you're just pull, you're pull, you're breaking through. Right. You're not pulling. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's more of a feel mm -hmm. your eyes. It's you, it's muscle memory, your eyes, whatever your eyes choose to lock on, whether it's the front of the rim or the back. That's one thing. But if you're if you're aiming Mm -hmm. If you're consciously aiming to a spot, I think that breaks your flow. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's all feel. Okay. It's all feel. And there's two more which kind of reinforce what you're saying. Slack. Now take up the slack of the trigger just before you need to increase pressure to break the shot. By taking up the slack early, you won't be slapping, tapping, jerking anything else on the trigger when the time comes to break the shot. It should be a surprise. So you should be able to break the shot 
and um, it should be surprising. And I've noticed that myself. My first shot is always dead on. Every single time, it's dead center of the target because I'm not thinking. I'm not doing anything except for like, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. And that's why people tend to startle themselves with guns because they don't understand when they're actually going to break and fire because there's always that slack within the trigger. You can take your PSI down. I don't recommend going below 4.5 because then your guns just can go off in your pocket. There has to be a good leverage on the trigger itself. But um, maybe when you talk about a fast release versus a slower release, mm -hmm. people's trigger can be at different rates or pressures or pounds. Uh -huh. you know? I like that. I like that. And I'm a big proponent in a faster release. I don't. I think you saw Iguodala, who's hitting threes now in the playoffs. If you notice, what he's done is, it, you take it to the gun, He's it's a quicker. he has a quicker trigger. He He has a very pronounced dip in his shot, right? He goes very down into his legs and then it's kind of a slowing finish. And my perspective on it is the bigger, the bigger, the dip, the longer the release, the more time for air. Now I'm in, and, and you tell, you say this to kids and all of a sudden they're rushing it and they're breaking their form and they're not following through. Mm -hmm. So it's a fine line, but I'm just saying that if you look at the quick release shooters mm -hmm. and you look at a lot of the great all time shooters, they're quick release shooters because they can replicate it over and over again with less air. You know what I mean? Ray Allen is the uh, the anomaly with his huge long jump shot, right? Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of the quick, and that's how they're teaching kids now. It's a quick, right? The Steph Curry evolution. Fair. There's just less motion in it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, that's pretty much the fundamental principles, and that's kind of the brass technique. Anyone who's trying to improve their shooting out of the target range, really get investigated mm -hmm. or get invested in the brass technique. Mm -hmm. It was made by a Marine after Pearl Harbor, and they've got this whole, this is my rifle you know, this is the one rifle. It is nothing without me. I am nothing without it. There's the Rifleman's Creed. I'd suggest that you look into it. It's pretty powerful stuff. Hmm, dope, dope. All right, well, so, yeah, we got, let's see here. I don't know when we'll get this out. So probably by the time we get this out, most of these game fours will be played. Um, are there any series that are in question here in this first round? It's kind of, oh, well, the one that we didn't cover, OKC and Utah. Um and have they only played two, right? Is game three today? I believe so. I I, I apologize for y'all for that. But I, I I believe this is game three, right? They split that. Mm -hmm. I'm right. Yeah. They've split in OKC. Game mm -hmm. three should be in Utah today. Um, a, Donovan Mitchell's that guy. What did OKC, they, 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 the big three didn't make a shot in the fourth <laughs> quarter, right? Yeah. And... Oh, Utah's going to win this series, barring an injury. That's just that's just that's how you, I see it. See? That's just how I see it, and um, we'll see. I think that the series will go long. It will be a six or seven game series. Houston and Minnesota, we didn't cover that, and I don't think we should. Carl Anthony Towns, um, yeah, I was I was about to go there, but I want to keep it. I want to I want to have I want to be able to have some ad revenue okay. on here. But I was about to. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. He, he's he he the. Towns is just disappointing, man. And I tweeted out, I tweeted out, he just flat out doesn't play hard enough mm -hmm. during that last game. And then after the game, Tibbs comes out and he's like, yeah, Towns is just not playing. It took me like, I turned on the game and it took me five minutes of just watching because what I do is I'll track a player. I, I won't watch the ball. Mm -hmm. I was telling you this and I'll just watch the player. I watched him for five minutes. So I'm like, dude, you're just not playing hard, bro. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're, co you're coasting around, you're floating around. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's very Colangelo-esque because that's exactly what he did. With his analytics, he would just tr track them throughout every movement that they. Would right, have. there's so much being you. You get you learn so much more. You you have to watch the details, like when they're standing around on an inbounds, the shot, the, just these little the little blinks, the Malcolm Gladwells, if you will, of each player, is how I can scout a guy pretty quickly, relatively quickly, I think. Um, so yeah, that series is probably going to be a sweep. Um, the the oak the, the oak, wolves the huh. The Wolves, the Wolves Rockets will be a sweep. Yeah. And then yeah. OKC Utah should go six or seven. I've got Utah. Um, Golden State and uh the Pelicans look like they're gonna sweep. So we'll cover that. It's kind of trying to get these pods in between these series and whatnot. Um, but yeah, man. So I hope I hope y'all enjoyed this. This was a heavy basketball centric episode. Um but hit that like, share, and subscribe. Subscribe on iTunes or Google Play if you want the audio versions of this. Um, and we're going to keep it moving.